Araw-araw ka bang nakatutok sa laptop o cellphone dahil sa work from home o online classes? Nararamdaman mo ba na parang tuyo o mahapdi ang iyong mga mata o di kaya nagluluha ang mga ito habang tumatagal ang paggamit mo ng mga electronic gadgets? Kung oo ang sagot mo sa aking mga tanong, maaaring nakararanas ka ng tinatawag na Tri Eye Syndrome. Ang Dry Eye Syndrome ay isang kondisyong dulot ng kakulangan sa dami ng luha o di kaya ay mabilis ang pagkatuyo ng luha na nagsasanhin ang pagkasira ng ating tear film. Ang mga karaniwang sanhi nito ay paggamit ng contact lenses, matagal ang pagtutok sa laptop o cellphone na kadalasang nagdudulot ng mas madalang na pagkurap, pananatili sa lugar na may air conditioning, mga sakit tulad ng allergies at diabetes, at matagal ang paggamit ng mga gamot tulad ng antihistamines at diuretics. Ilan sa mga simptomas ng dry eye syndrome ay ang mga sumusunod. Pakiramdam na may buhangin sa mata, panandali ang panlalabo ng paningin, pagiging sensitibo sa maliliwanag na ilaw, pamumula ng mata, at madalas na pagluluha ng mata. Ano nga bang maaari mong gawin para maiwasan ang dry eye? Bigyang pansin ang pagkurap habang nagbabasa, nanonood ng telebisyon, o di kaya habang gumagamit ng mga gadgets. Ugaliin ang 20-20-20. Take a break every 20 minutes at tumingin sa isang bagay na 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Siguraduhin ding tama ang paggamit ng contact lenses. At iwasan ang pagharap at pagtutok sa electric fan o air conditioning unit. Kung ang iyong mga sintomas ay nagpatuloy o lumala, kumonsulta na sa pinakamalapit na ophthalmologist.
Araw-araw ka bang nakatutok sa laptop o cellphone dahil sa work from home o online classes? Nararamdaman mo ba na parang tuyo o mahapdi ang iyong mga mata o di kaya nagluluha ang mga ito habang tumatagal ang paggamit mo ng mga electronic gadgets? Kung oo ang sagot mo sa aking mga tanong, maaaring nakararanas ka ng tinatawag na dry eye syndrome. Ang dry eye syndrome ay isang kondisyong dulot ng kakulangan sa dami ng luha o di kaya ay mabilis ang pagkatuyo ng luha na nagsasanhi ng pagkasira ng ating tear film. Ang mga karaniwang sanhi nito ay paggamit ng contact lenses, matagalang pagtutok sa laptop o cellphone na kadalasang nagdudulot ng mas madalang na pagkurap, pananatili sa lugar na may air conditioning, mga sakit tulad ng allergies at diabetes, at matagalang paggamit ng mga gamot tulad ng antihistamines at diuretics. Ilan sa mga simptomas ng dry eye syndrome ay ang mga sumusunod. Pakiramdam na may buhangin sa mata, panandali ang panlalabo ng paningin, pagiging sensitibo sa maliliwanag na ilaw, pamumula ng mata, at madalas na pagluluha ng mata. Ano nga bang maaari mong gawin para maiwasan ang dry eye? Bigyang pansin ang pagkurap habang nagbabasa, nanonood ng telebisyon, o di kaya habang gumagamit ng mga gadgets. Ugaliin ang 20-20-20. Take a break every 20 minutes at tumingin sa isang bagay na 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Siguraduhin ding tama ang paggamit ng contact lenses. At iwasan ang pagharap at pagtutok sa electric fan o air conditioning unit. Kung ang iyong mga sintomas ay nagpatuloy o lumala, kumonsulta na sa pinakamalapit na ophthalmologist.
Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our channel. It's 5 p.m. on a Thursday here in Manila, and you know what that means. Okay, it's time again for our another episode of TMC ITV Family Construction Without Borders. I'm your host, Dr. Ivo Duan, and uh, to join me will be my one friend and colleague from the Philippine Corner Society, Dr. Mara Okubilio. Okay, so um, it's the 10th episode, so uh, we are very happy to have this program continue all the time. And because of that, we would like to thank you, all our subscribers, viewers, and of course, our, our sponsors supporting TSCI TV, all the way from our first episode in June until this one. So without further ado, to begin our program, uh, let us once hear again from the director of the TNTI and Vision Institute, Victor Kaparaz. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, today, we shall tackle one topic of particular interest, not just for us cornea specialists, but for all ophthalmologists in general. It's again time for our Thursday afternoon habit. We are in another episode of TMC ITV. Ophthalmic instruction without borders. Okay, so in this particular uh, episode, we will be particular on uh, discussing a particular machine, which is the Oculus Keratograph 5M. It is an advanced corneal topographer with a built-in teratometer and a color camera optimized for external imaging. Its unique features include being able to examine the memovian glands, measure non-invasively tear breakup time, and evaluate the lipid layer of the tear film. And so we have invited experts from both local and internationally to show the intricacies of this machine based on their experience and knowledge with the different features of the Karatograph 5M. 5M. Without further ado, let us get to know our speakers from this afternoon. Okay, so We've had numerous episodes that tackled this very pressing and common problem, and hopefully most of us have already mastered the concepts of dry eye disease. To supplement this knowledge, I would like to introduce our first speakers. Our first lecturer will cover the basics of dry eye screening using the Genvis Classic 
uh, to be given to us by our very own Dr. Margarita Mejia. Marga is a colleague and a member of our LASIK Center family and a homegrown refractive specialist. She finished her residency training here at the Medical City and then took her fellowship training on refractive surgery at the Singapore National Eye Center. Marga is also an active faculty at the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. So without further ado, Myra. Okay, so I think we're having technical problems with Myra. Uh, I'll introduce all the speakers. So our next speaker also, after Myra, will give a more detailed explanation of the functions and features of the Genvis Pro. We have with us Dr. Alex Muntz, all the way from Auckland, New Zealand, where he is a postdoctoral research fellow at ophthalmology at the Department of University of Auckland. He, is also, he also previously finished his master's in optometry and doctorate degree in vision science at the Ernst Abbe University of Applied Sciences in Germany and at the University of Waterloo, Canada, respectively. And to end this first segment on this afternoon's episode will be delivered by Oliver Wu. He will take us through his expertise, which is contact lens fitting. Dr. Wu is an optometrist at the University of New South, South Wales, Australia, and currently the Vice President and Counselor of the Asia Optometric Management Academy. He is also the Chair and Lead for Orthokeratology and Myopia Management of, Asia, of the Asia Optometric Congress. His fields of expertise include pediatric optometry, myopia prevention and control, contact lens fitting, and specialty contact lenses. So let's not wait any longer. Before we begin, I would like to inform our viewers that we will have a short Q&A after this segment. So if you have any questions for any of the speakers, please do not hesitate to type your questions in the comment section. Again, let us welcome Dr. Mihia, Dr. Muntz, and Dr. Wu for their interesting lectures. Good afternoon to our dear IPV viewers. Thank you for the kind introduction, Evo. During the last episode, digital eye strain was extensively talked about, which is very timely in this present situation. Now, in line with that, using any digital media at this time is one of the reasons why many people experience the symptoms of dry eyes. And the diagnostic tool that I will talk about precisely looks at this clinical condition. So I hope today's topic will also be useful for everyone. I am here to give you an insight on the Oculus Keratograph 5M, which we can use as one of our tools in diagnosing dry eyes disease. Likewise, I will give you a brief walkthrough on what is included in the dry eyes workup and how to interpret the report to make it useful not only for the cornea refractive specialists, but more so for any ophthalmologist as we diagnose, treat, monitor, and educate our patients for this common eye condition. This will make it easier for our patients to better understand the importance of why they have to be treated, to be continuously monitored, and more importantly, to increase their compliance to their medications. This talk aims to know the value of the Keratograph 5M in diagnosing dry eyes disease, and secondly, to learn how to interpret the Keratograph 5M report. Dry eyes disease is the most common ocular disorder and its growing number demands our attention. Correct diagnosis and treatment can improve simple daily tasks, such as working on the computer or using your mobile phone. It can be used as a general screening tool and also to diagnose dry eyes in systemic conditions, such as Graves' ophthalmopathy, and Sjogren's syndrome, among others. It can likewise be part of screening prior to a surgical intervention, such as cataract extraction with planned premium IOL implantation and in refractive surgery. It can also aid assessing patients 
with contact lens intolerance, and even in monitoring patients who might have dry eyes as a side effect of their ocular medications, such as in glaucoma. Today, every clinic globally where visual services are offered encounter patients with dry eyes disease on a daily basis. Various factors contribute to the prevalence of dry eyes disease. There is no single diagnostic test that can successfully be used to diagnose dry eyes disease on its own. A combination of various tests increases the probability into getting the correct diagnosis and treatment. In line with this, the keratograph can help us in having an objective assessment. It is a machine that is easy to use, comfortable to our patients, and it can help us in breaking down the diagnosis as to the type of dry eyes disease our patient has. We can actively integrate the keratograph in our consultation by correlating our clinical history and physical examination. It can also support us in communicating and educating our patients, and it can also be used to monitor response to treatment with serial comparative analysis. The following is an overview of the non-invasive versus invasive test procedures available for dry eyes. Traditionally, the common objective diagnostic tests to assess the tear film and diagnose dry eyes disease are known as Schirmer and Fluorescein breakup time. However, the Schirmer test may have low reproducibility, sensitivity, and specificity. Also, the test is somewhat invasive in nature. The breakup time with fluorescein is the most frequently used, but installation of the fluorescein can destabilize the tear film. Non or minimally invasive tests have the major advantage of capturing data from the surface without significantly inducing reflex tearing. These non-invasive techniques have the potential to represent the true state of the ocular surface. Patient comfort, objective results, and the ability to measure the tear film in the steady state further adds to the advantages of these non-invasive tests. This is where the value of the Oculus Keratograph 5M is seen. The Oculus Keratograph 5M is a high-resolution color camera with an integrated magnification changer. Here you can see the different magnifications for the different test procedures. The tear film can be assessed with both white and infrared lights. The following are the non-invasive tests that can be assessed by the keratograph. Presence of symptoms and different signs assist with the classification of dry eyes disease and the keratograph forms part of this evaluation process. What is in the report? This is an example of the classic Genvis dry eye report that is generated at the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute dry eyes clinic. This slide is just showing you how it generally looks like. These are sent to the requesting physicians and or patients. The photo on the screen is the actual printout. That is why it may seem small, but we will go over them later on in detail. The first page shows you a summary or general overview of all the assessments done. It is separated into two columns for the right and left eye. It is color-coded with green indicating normal values, yellow as mild, orange as moderate, and red as abnormal or severe. The next page is the working impression based on the results of the individual tests done, including some treatment recommendations. Finally, it is followed by a simple description of what the tests were and is worded simply so that even your patients could easily understand the report. Let us now attempt to break down the different tests done. It is recommended that we start with all the non-invasive tests first before proceeding to the somewhat invasive tests. The first one taken is the tear meniscus height or TMH. It is taken using either infrared or white illumination. This evaluates the quality, quantity of the tear film where we use a built-in caliper to measure the height of the tear meniscus 
with the normal value set at greater than or equal to 0 0.20 millimeters. The photo on your left shows you a normal tear meniscus height with a measured value of 0 0.27 millimeters versus another photo showing a low TMH value of 0 0.13. Next is the non-invasive keratograph breakup time, or some may call it locally as NICBOT. This is used to evaluate the quality and stability of the tear film where the pseudo rings are reflected on the corneal surface and distortion in the reflected mires are recorded as a break in the tear film. The color map on the right of your screen shows the areas of breaks where the warmer red and orange colors indicate shorter breakup times. This is another NICBOT result map, which shows the first breakup time to be short at 4.72 seconds and an average breakup time of 6.86 seconds. We also have the scleral red disc grading, or R scan, which detects the scleral to blood vessel ratio. The software analyzes the thin conjunctival vessels and grades it automatically using a bulbar redness score of 0 to 4. It is the percentage ratio between the vessels and the rest of the analyzed area. The maximum ratio, according to the manufacturer, is 40%. So in this example, the bulbar redness score was 3.9, which means that the, ratio, that the ratio is 39%. The patient's perception of their ocular dryness is likewise assessed by means of their subjective symptoms through a dry eye questionnaire. The Ocular Surface Disease Index, or OSDI, is commonly used and validated. It includes 12 questions related to the patient's experience during the previous week regarding ocular symptoms, its severity, how it affects their visual function, and the ocular response to environmental triggers. The score can range from 0 to 100, with a higher score being worse. For example, your patient answered all 12 questions, and after computation, the OSDI score will then be plotted. So for a value of 52.1, with all 12 questions answered, we can grade them as having a moderate OSDI score. Next is the MABO scan. It is used to observe and evaluate the morphological changes in the MABOMIAN glands on both the upper and lower lids. Infrared diodes in the hardware are used to transilluminate the upper and lower eyelids. The MABO score is graded based on the area of loss of mebomian glands. So for example, if upon evaluation of the MABO scan, there is at least greater than one third to about two thirds dropout in the patient's mebomian glands, that is graded as grade two. Now we evaluate the quality of the lipid layer. This exam uses the principle of white light interferometry, while a video or image is recorded for the duration of about two to three eyelid blinks to optimally assess the distribution of the lipid on the surface of the tear film. Here we are observing the colorful fringes. A normal lipid layer is indicated by the bronze reflections being seen on the image. An increase in the color fringes to a reddish blue hue is an indicator of a thickened lipid layer. And a white or colorless reflection is interpreted as a thin lipid layer. The video on the left shows us a high or thick lipid layer. Comparing it with the video on the right, showing us a thin lipid layer. Increased osmolarity indicates dry eyes, as suggested by the International Dry Eyes Workshop Group. This test is also performed and incorporated in the whole dry eyes report. It is painless and quick 
and requires less than 100 nanoliters of tears. So even with severe dry eyes, we are still able to do this examination. And this is your tear lab grading chart with 306 milliosmos per liter as the cutoff. The Schirmer's test, which majority of us are familiar with, is also included, being one of the tools used to measure aqueous tear production. Traditionally, the basic secretion test is measured using anesthesia and placing the filter paper on the lateral one-third of the inferior cul-de-sac. The patient's eyes are then closed for five minutes and the amount of wetting on the filter strip is measured with a normal value greater than or equal to 10 millimeters. At the end of the report, you will then see some recommendations to help referring physicians and patients customize their treatment based on the keratograph working diagnosis, its individual components, and plan on a targeted approach to their treatment. Now, over the past several months, we have also incorporated the Tear Film Oriented Diagnosis, or TFON, from the Asia Dry Eye Society in our Dry Eye Clinic report. Aside from the parameters that have been discussed, using the color imaging function and video capability of the keratograph to take real-life fluorescing images and videos, we evaluate the Tear Film dynamics and breakup patterns and classify them into either aqueous deficient decreased wettability, and or increased evaporative dry eyes. Depending on the subtype of dry eyes, we are able to distinguish the insufficient components of the ocular surface that are responsible for each breakup pattern in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion. I am not going to go through this as this has been extensively discussed by Professor Yokoi in a previous episode. Just a short breakup pattern refresher, should you see this breakup pattern on the left video, which is a spot break, then you would think of a decreased wettability type of dry eyes. As compared to this breakup pattern on your right, which is an area break, then you would have a working impression of aqueous tear deficient dry eyes. After having done all the tests, how do we interpret them now? A deficiency in either quantity or quality of the tear film can lead to dry eyes disease. This diagram shows a general classification for dry eyes disease proposed by the International Dry Eye Workshop Group, namely evaporative dry eyes and aqueous deficient dry eyes, both of which can be influenced by the effect of environmental and biological factors. Both aqueous deficient and evaporative dry eyes can lead to increased evaporation and decreased tear film stability. Distinguishing between these two groups and determining if they exist individually or as a combination is crucial for dry eyes disease diagnosis and treatment. Evaporative dry eyes account for more than 50% of all dry eyes cases, but both forms usually occur simultaneously in the most severe cases. What do, we be, what do we make of all the values in the different tests done? To synthesize the results, this is a simple table to screen for dry eyes using the keratograph to help us in the diagnosis, which will later on be important as to our treatment decisions. Example A, if patient has no symptoms, tear volume is normal with no disruption in tear film stability, no staining, and normal osmolarity, then our patient is more likely normal. Example B, patient has subjective symptoms, the tear volume is low, patient also has a decreased nick bot, positive ocular surface staining, increased osmolarity, no meibomian glands drop out, then you could have a working diagnosis of aqueous deficient dry eyes. Example C, Patient has subjective symptoms, tear volume is normal, nick bot is decreased, positive for ocular surface staining, increased osmolarity, and there is meibomian gland dropout on MIBO scan. We could then diagnose the patient as having evaporative dry eyes with meibomian gland dysfunction. 
Here is a sample report of a patient done at the dry ice clinic that may help us identify the type of dry ice our patient has by collating all the results. What is projected is the actual screen capture and may be difficult to read, especially if you're using your mobile phone screens now, but I will summarily go over them. As earlier mentioned, it is color-coded to signify that green is normal, yellow is mild, orange is moderate, and red is severe or abnormal. This report shows the TMH, which is within the normal green spectrum, but slightly going towards yellow for both eyes. The NIC bot was short for both eyes, seen to be at the yellow zone. No redness noted, thus the blue dot is in the green zone. OSDI score was mild. Grade 1 dropped out on Mabel scan. Dipid layer showed a very pale whitish hue, signifying a significant lipid deficit. Normal osmolarity for both eyes. No staining and a normal Schirmer test reading for both eyes. This reading may give you an impression of mild evaporative dry eyes with meibomian gland dysfunction. This is another case, this time showing us a low TMH seen at the red zone. Short nick bot of less than 7 seconds, also at the red zone. Mild redness on R scan for both eyes. Severe OSDI score. Grade 1 on Mabo scan. Left eye had a moderate increase in osmolarity with grade 4 staining for both eyes. And a Schirmer's test reading of less than 5 millimeters for the left eye and about 10 for the right. That, thus, our working impression for this is severe aqueous deficient dry eyes. And if you combine it with an area break breakup pattern, it is another objective finding for the said diagnosis. Just recently, the software in our institute has been upgraded from the classic to the Genvis Pro. The interface may change a little, but it is still a complete dry eyes workup with all the tests that I have mentioned included in its menu but it can now be further individualized with add-ons to the work list, such as assessing for the meibomian gland orifice, presence of the langectasia, and even meibomian gland secretion, among other things. We can likewise do a follow-up analysis on our post-treatment patients. So you will be seeing this in the months to come as we add them to the workup of all our patients seen at the dry eyes clinic. These additional features will be further discussed by our next speaker. With regard to the differences between countries as to the points of emphasis for the diagnosis and treatment of dry eyes, whether you follow the JUICE 2 classification or would want to adapt the Asia Dry Eye Society TFOD classification or a combination of both, the keratograph helps you break down the different components of the tear film instability and allows you to have a customized approach in treating dry eyes by being able to identify the different components contributing to the condition of your individual patient. To end, diagnosing dry eyes is a science. It is now not just telling patients to apply eye drops and go home. Aside from your clinical history and ophthalmologic evaluation, you can now correlate it with additional objective diagnostic tools that could help us come up with the exact type of dry eyes our patient has and have a concrete foundation for the treatment plan that is best for them. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, many thanks for joining. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, tonight with you in my first uh, ITV episode. And as I load up my slides, I want to thank um, the organizers. I want to thank Oculus and uh, Mr. Richard White for having me on. I want to thank Dr. Tina Tan um, for her help in organizing and the entire TMC uh, production crew for making sure um, everything is running smoothly. Um, fantastic learning opportunity, and I've been invited to talk about the Genvis Dry Eye Report Pro and the Oculus Keratograph um, 5M. And I said yes for two reasons. 
First, uh, in my role, I'm involved in a range of studies on dry eye from the pathophysiology, diagnosis, treatment, and also large epidemiological studies on the prevalence of dry eye disease in the world. And here in the ocular surface lab um, in Auckland, but also most of our international partners, the tear film and ocular surface analysis module of the keratograph is central to most, if not all, uh, dry eye research. And I see it emerging as the foundational building block, if you will, in the modern diagnosis of dry eye. And that's a scientific argument that's not biased because many of the diagnostic tools it offers are increasingly well validated, which is why I stand behind it. The second reason, and also a disclosure, um, is that I've been involved with Genvis from very early on, and I want to share some of these insights, and I guess that is bias. Um, so I want to share with you some of the background and motivation behind the creation of the Pro, some of the differences to the earlier versions, and why I believe the Pro to be a valuable tool for your clinical practice. So let's start with some background on uh, Genvis. It's a research institute in Jena, beautiful little town in the heart of Germany. Um, and if you've paid attention to my pronunciation, I called it Jena, not Jena. That brings us to our first German lesson for uh, tonight. So it's Jena, as in the word Jena, yeah, so Jena. Therefore, it's not Genvis, but it's actually Jenvis, like the Japanese Yen. So that's just, if you want to sound like a pro, you may call it Genvis, but don't worry. If you'll call it Genvis, everyone will still know what you mean. So Jena is a place with a lot of optical history. It's been called the Optical Valley, kind of like the Silicon Valley in California, because it's the birthplace of modern optics. Um, big names stand behind it, uh, most prominently Carl Zeiss, but also others. Carl Zeiss was born here. So Genvis or Jenvis stands on the shoulders of giants, really. And myself, I trained in optometry in Jena, and myself standing on the shoulders of two giants, we see here uh, Professor Zick, Wolfgang Zickenberg and Sebastian Marx. They were my supervisors during my training and also the founders of Genvis. And as a young student, uh, it's me right there, right after graduation, I was initiated in the world of research through clinical trials on contact lenses at Genvis. And one of the first research projects that I was ever involved in, uh, Genvis, was the early stage development of the dry eye module, the original dry eye module for the keratograph. And as an example, the non-invasive breakup time, the concept of the reflection of the Myers, borrowed from the corneal topographer and projected onto the tear film and their automated assessment, was invented and validated here at the Genvis. And over the years, in close collaboration with, with Oculus, researchers at Genvis has improved and expanded the dry eye module of the keratograph, including the Genvis Classic that Dr. Mejia has introduced and its latest iteration, the Dry Eye Report Pro. In a nutshell, as the name implies, the Pro is a tool for the Pro. It's more, better, faster, stronger, and more versatile, offering everything that a Pro professional toolkit uh, for dry eye diagnosis and management requires. But I want to talk about the why, the reasons that led to the creation of the pro. And there are three forces or demands that pulled it into existence. We have the users or the clinicians, the practitioners. There's the patients. And then finally, there's the science behind it. And I want to look at these in turn. So we must remember the Genvis Pro was developed and the Genvis Dry Report was developed in between Germany and Switzerland. You must remember this is the land of Audi and Mercedes and Swiss watches, where patients demand high quality service and advanced technology. So if we stick with this car analogy for a moment and look back one generation before the Genvis Classic, we have the first dry eye module of the Kratograph, the original one, still a great car, uh, but the Genvis Classic took dry eye management to a whole new level because now the patient had more than just a diagnosis of, as Dr. Mejia said, you have dry eye, MGD, here's some drops, come back in a month. But the patient walked away with a powerful educational tool and a better understanding of their condition and also a better grasp of the value of the assessment that was just performed. So the next generation, the Pro, is just like the fierce Audi RS4 here. 
better, faster, stronger, looking a bit sexier, and admittedly also a bit scary. The report, as you can see here, is customized and expanded, turning into a more powerful educational resource that really highlights the value of the assessments performed. Not a disclosure, I do not drive an Audi, unfortunately. Ultimately, patients, like all of us, want value, and the pro really provides. So what does it provide? First off, um, kind of like the classic more tests. There are several more tests, including uh, allowing it to cover many or most of tear film inocular surface tests required for a thorough modern dry eye diagnosis. More and more of these tests are scientifically validated, which is crucial. And I will come back to that in a bit. But for example, osmolarity testing, as already mentioned, mybography, but also lid margin staining. And some of the questionnaires we see are in increasingly gaining traction, showing good sensitivity, specificity, with some of this work being conducted in our own group here as well. Some of these tests are built into the cratograph, others are external, such as, for instance, the Inflamadry, MMP9, for instance. Um, but the pro allows you to incorporate these into your routine almost like a hub. Speaking of value, for you as a clinician, more tests mean more chair time, which is where the second force of practitioners demanded a more efficient workflow. And because different practitioners have different needs, flexibility and customization were key as well. And you know, if we're talking efficiency and we can't trust the Germans to be efficient, and I'm not sure what we can trust these days anymore. The Pro offers two new modes of operation, which really help optimize your workflow. Under the capture mode, which is a new mode, the software automatically switches from one test to the next in the order you established without the extra clicks and without constantly changing signs between eyes. That's a really great feature I call stay on the eye, is that you move from one test to the next as you stay on the eye you last measured, and the software moves on to the next test automatically. This alone cuts down the capture time in half with no extra focusing, movement, the patient sitting back, etc. The patient stays in the chin rest and all measurements are captured back to back. There's no grading or evaluation at this point, that is done later. So a technician can do all this capture and the eye dog comes in then for the assessment. And under the assessment mode, all captured measurements are displayed on the screen in kind of a neat overview, allowing you to select and grade them in turn and discuss them with the patient, really taking them along the investigation. This really allows you for more one-on-one -on -one time with the patient, which greatly enhances their experience and increases the perceived value of each separate assessment. Finally, the pro distinguishes three other new modes of operation from the usual drop-down menu. Um, you can select screening, uh, a set of essential tests you can and probably should run on every new patient walking in. This takes about five minutes for both eyes and gives you an indication of whether further testing is warranted. If so, the individual mode offers you the full battery of tests, enabling you to run a full dry eye workup, customized to your needs. We find this really powerful in clinical settings with high patient throughput. We use it in teaching students in dry eye assessments or in our dry eye specialty clinic. Finally, in the follow-up mode, you are able to compare measurements, returning patients, and to evaluate the success of treatment. The good news is that you are in control of tests, the order, the grading skills used, and even creating separate customized workflows for your different scenarios. So for each of the operation modes, you are able to select your capture and or assessment items as needed. And you can do this for the patient report as well, choosing what goes in, the treatment recommendation, and so on and so forth, which, as Dr. Mejia showed, this image-based resource is really easy to use and to understand by the patient. Now, this all may seem a bit daunting and complex, but only if you, you know, still believe that a Sherma test is all you need. The complexity simply reflects the advanced level of the field. So there's no way around 
sitting down with it and deciding which tests to use and when, in which order, how to grade these findings and how to adapt your management strategy accordingly. You set it and forget it, as they say. Finally, I want to take a moment to talk about the science, which is the third major force behind the pro and behind all this complexity we see in dry eye. The reality is that we're witnessing a real scientific revolution and a sort of paradigm shift in our understanding of dry eye. Technology plays a key role, of course, but there have been a series of global consensus building workshops taking an evidence-based approach to a field that was historically inclined to rely on clinical experience. Dr. Mejia has already spoken about the TIFOS um, reports and the TIFOS from Inocular Surface Society, which has brought together expertise to review the knowledge base and highlight the gaps in dry eye disease. Much of that work of the TIFOS dues one was incorporated in the Genvis Classic, making it a powerful first step to merge advanced imaging technology with validated, non-invasive and evidence-based diagnosis and bringing into your clinical practice. This though began much earlier with the 1995 National Eye Institute workshop, where we first began to understand dry disease as more than just tear insufficiency and to realize that just the Sherma test is just not enough. The latest workshop in the series, the TFOS DUS 2, has been the most significant step forward to date, bringing together over 150 experts in 23 countries to review and revise our understanding of dry eye disease and have published, published a massive report in the Ocular Surface Journal. And it has had a tremendous impact in science. And just to give you a better idea of the magnitude of this impact, Let's look at the impact factor, a metric for scientific journals used to track article citations and sometimes rank uh, journals. And compared here between a few of the common journals in the field. Take a look at 2017 when the TFOS used two reports were published until last year, the impact factor of the Ocular Surface Journal has tripled. It has effectively propelled this journal to the most highly ranked scientific journal for ocular research in the entire field of ophthalmology, which is a very unusual trajectory. Of course, this is just a selection of journals. But the report on definition and classification of dry eye disease, so our, our revised understanding of dry eye disease, just to take an example, which was co-authored by my colleague and current mentor here in, in Auckland, Professor Jennifer Craig, was one of the top 0.1% most cited papers across all of clinical medicine. So what the Genvis report and the Oculus have done with the PRO was to create a framework that enables you to incorporate the way we currently understand dry eye diagnosis. So looking at the blue box in the center here, screening and clinic, uh, sorry, symptoms and clinical signs, to incorporate that into your clinical practice and streamline it. So it's actually feasible and not as daunting as it may seem from this figure. Ultimately, the goal is to better distinguish the subtype and the severity of disease and manage it accordingly which is something we can spend many more hours and days talking about. We don't have time now. Just like I can keep uh, dreaming of uh, the Audi RS4. And since we've agreed that the international symbol for the Genesis reports is the Audi, which will get me into serious trouble, um, might as well align um, these cars with the science. Very scientific thing to do. To conclude, if I may use a tier from analogy, the pro, offers better quantity and quality, but really allows you to keep abreast of these and other latest scientific advancements in dry eye and to direct your clinical management according to the latest, albeit ever evolving standards. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and pass on the microphone. Nope, that's the mouse across the pond uh, from New Zealand to Australia to Dr. Oliver Wu. Thank you very much.
Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, hello from Australia, and uh, love to share with you about uh, today about how we use the keratograph K5 in the quantum lens fitting. And let's have a look how we can use the Oculus K5 for uh, quantum lens fitting now. Uh, some disclosures about this presentation today. And let's look at the content lens fitting we can do in K5. So why we need to use the K5 and um, what are the features in the K5? And let's have a look at anything more we can do with the K5 in our, um, uh, in our content lens fitting or in our practice or in a clinic or in the optical store. So there are quite numbers of, of uh, type of contact lenses we are using, like soft contact lenses, uh, like spherical, toric, multifocal, RGP lenses, uh, such as corneal lenses, corneal scleral, scleral orthokeratology. So a lot of lenses that we need to have a topographer or keratometer nowadays, people's a keratometer for contact lens fitting. I think this keratometer is definitely not sufficient for nowadays, especially for our clinic or practice, we want to practice professionally and also take care of their patient's eye. We need a proper uh, topographer to look at the corneal details about how we do it properly. So let's have a look. Whoa, shum, like the man in black, the scan. We the scan of the eyes so we can see what's happening now and what's going to happen to the cornea in the future as well. So some scan, that's why you need a proper scan for fitting contact lenses now. So let's have a look at the K5 scan. K5 scan can do a lot of things that we have heard about the dry eyes uh, from a two speaker. And when more speaker talk about the dry eye things using K5. K5 can do more than just the dry eyes. So we have a look what's a K5 scan. So they're using the placido method for topography. So they can projecting to proceed uh, the K5 when they're doing uh, using placido method. So what do we need in continence fitting? Okay, in the K5, it gives us a lot of information like the keratol metric data, the K value, the corneal shape, the eccentricity value. Now we do a lot of things with eccentricity, especially when we do a bit more uh, specialty lenses nowadays. So we have to look at the eccentricity and also something we always look into it, the elevations. Elevation is something very important. So in the future, we have more time, we can talk a bit more of the elevations and the corneal informations. So in fitting corneal, we have to know the HVID. And the pupil size is very really important now when fitting contour lenses, especially nowadays, more contour lenses got more um, special feature like multifocal contact lenses and like ortho character lenses or lot of things we need to know the pupil size so we know how to get the best for them. And the K4 also gives us a lot of understanding of the prescription, especially contact, especially toric lens fitting. So we have to know how we fit the lens properly, especially toric lens fitting, right? Where the astigmatism, how much corneal seal and the lenticular seal as well. So a lot of things that we need to know about what we're doing. And especially K5 uh, is a topographer, not a normal keratometer. So it also helps us detect a corneal problem like a keratoconic. So we can have a nice good scan and we can see a lot of information about the cornea. So this is a, like a typical, uh, uh, like a readout from um, a K5. So it gives us a nice color topo topography map. Nice color, you can see all the different color, you know what's the uh, 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 diopter changes, the variation like this one's a, a really, really high the limbo to limbo corneal astigmatism eye. So also gives us a really nice iris image with the pupil, which hit VID, more than three millimeters, three millimeters of a keratometer autorefractor. Okay, this is something more than an autorefractor. Okay, and also give us a lot of information, the, uh, the data, the K values, uh, E values, uh, all the things that we can tell about the cornea. So there's got a lot of information about it. So look at these things is in the continence fitting module, and we can see uh, once it, when we measure the eye, so we select the lenses, what lenses, which lab company lens design we are in, they will have a simulations of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a lens come out. So this is the left side. We can see that's is where the actual lens looks like on the cornea. So uh, what what the picture we capture some features on the K five. So um, that is how the imaging um, 
on the K5, or on the simulation on the left hand side, then actually how we can capture actual lenses on the eye. So we can have a look this video about um, the K5 and we click the videos because K5 can uh, capture the video and the still image. So we put the lens on and have the patient look into the mirror, uh, the camera and put the first lens, could be in the uh, Cobra Blues so and can see lens movement. And uh, we click, um, bling, 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 have the patient blinking and you can see the lens movement and you can see push, push a little bit, we can see um, how the lens actually locating on the cornea. Those, this was some things that been really helpful for us uh, in the saving a lot of chair time and also know where the lenses will locate and when we actually order the lenses. Okay, next thing we can have some video play from the background. Okay, we can have the video play in the background. Can we have the video play from the background? Yep. And we're going to explain about how we're going to do for the uh, features of the contour lens fitting and so how we choose the lenses. Uh, and also that some lenses. And we go for the contour lens fitting. And when we do the lens fitting, it will load all the contour lenses from uh, the time. And we can see them here. So there's a lot of that uh, available in here. And lots of labs available. And let's have a look at this case. And then we can go to this case. It's all flex K. Okay. So it shows us how this looks like. And we calculate the person pattern based on this, how it's going to fit in the cornea. And then we put the trial lens or maybe the order and virtually we can make it fit. And let's say we get a different map. Let's say maybe seven from UK. So there are quite a number of different lenses available. So we get the current design, okay, let's say current design, maybe we get a play house with the distance. So let's say we look at the first in pattern. Hmm, quite a nice fit. So let's say I have a small lens, size six. Let's have a look. We can see by clicking in here, we can see the current lenses, this is what the current lens is And this is quite a good. The lab that can help us do a lot of uh, uh, information from the lab. And we can see a lot of information. And let's say have a flat one. Let's see. The flat one. Okay. We can see the map in like this. And we can scan the one. We can see the standard ones with the blue. And then the flatter one, we can see the next blue. And let's say you have a bigger size one. So it helps us to do a lot of things without fucking around and see the fit. And this is the uh, a flat of it. So you can see the person pattern in a similar form. So you have the trial lens or we all or with the actual lens and you can see the map. So it's really good and helpful for us with all the information in here. So we can see. We can see the lens movement uh, using the camera and the Google Blue Vision help us to analyze the lens movement a little bit. So a lot we can do to see a bit better. And it's quite good. And we can go curves nicely. Reverse curve, base curve, reverse curve, that final curve, you know. And this ends on. We will have some more lens fitting uh, lecture later. Then we everyone.
this is how we look at the map of the topography map, the colors, all the information. And by we can see one lot color maps in here. All the information we want from diopters, color wise, photometric information is equal size. So when we look at the four different maps, sometimes we'd love to see the big overview. So we can see the axial elevation, tangential refractive. Elevation are really important maps that we need to understand um, in the future, especially for correct contact lenses. Okay, let's have a look how we look at the uh, comparison of two lenses fitting, I mean the pose and pre. So we can see the right eye. And it's an axial map and pressure to curve. You can see the curve will change, which more flattened. So we can see the correction changes. And let's go to tangential. Tangential map show us where the lens was sitting. So we can see the lens was sitting. And then it's slightly here. And when we look at the refractive map, we can see the refractive map is where the power train is. So one from the front arm to the right arm. Then that's the left eye. As your refractive changes, not bad. Some of them are 1.5, it's so only about 40 minutes square, so you can make two a little bit longer hours. And there's a tangential map. The tangential map, you can see where the red ring is, and that's the axial map. And the uh, axial and refractive map. So you can see, there's still quite a nice sensation. That's something a lot to think of know about what these lenses can do for us. And also the software as well. Okay, good. So we just um, heard about how we do the uh, contact lens fitting, like the optical characterology. The one we just saw before, we have the two uh, two corneal fitting. Uh, one actually we intentionally to fit steeper, so the you might notice the right eye, the lens drop a bit more, and the left eye is the proper. I mean, we just got the maximum, uh, the out optimal fitting, so we can see the lenses might make the center. Probably, I, I believe we have uh, definitely have more opportunity. We can run a whole one hour, two hours uh, workshop in how to do contact lens fitting, especially in uh, LGP or maybe even also characterology lenses. I think we're looking forward for the future. We have more interaction on this uh, fun time together uh, from all over the world. And another feature for the K5 is the papillometry. So this application is can check for the neuron, neuronal problems, such as like afferent pupil reaction, especially on people playing for the uh, uh, football player. Sometimes they get massive impact to their eye and to the head that will affect the pupil. So at the same time, we can use the, this to check for the pupil size under different lighting condition, especially selecting the contact lenses. As I said before, some special lenses nowadays, uh, some soft lenses, they're quite pupil dependent. So we know how the pupil size, and we can choose the right lenses for the patient. And also for single vision LGP, uh, multifocal contact lenses, as I said before, like soft lens LGP, sometimes with the design lenses, we know how to uh, determine the treatment zone, how to adjust all the, curve to make the lens centration much better. And also the ortho K lenses. So ortho K lenses, we know how we make the lens a center. And also in a lot of the time, people talk about the myopic control lenses. So where, how we can make get the myopic, uh, the focus more in and smaller. That is something a lot of the time we all want to know how to get the optimal fit and do the best things. So a good uh, machines will help us do a lot of work and also help us do a lot of uh, great things for our patients. This is a video about how the papillometry is working in different lighting. We can see the pupil size and in the, especially in the toric LGP lenses, we can see where the locations of the lens and also how the lens actual center. So we can get a lot of information about how we can use the machine that like K5 is more than just a, um, a keratometer or topographer or people just think about K5. It's just a machine to do dry eyes. Okay, a lot of people forgot 
this is more than the dryer machines. And that's a good thing to help us to measure that pupil size in a different lighting, like a dynamic measurement. So a lot of the things we can also use this feature, like iris image overlay the comparison map. So we can know where the iris is, where the pupil is, so we can see how we can use the machines to give us more information about how we do the quantum lens fitting and to achieve the optimal uh, result, uh, both fitting wise and also visual wise. And let's have a look at one of the case studies I want to share with um, everyone. Okay, there's a subject called uh, CH. It's my myopic management patient. She's a six years of age young girl. And that's a prescription minus 075 or 50 seal for the right, and the level 50 minus 050 and 175. And that's excellent. 2323 and the level is 2310. So uh, we know this is longer than what the average six years old age girls with this prescription, much longer. So the parents declined to use low dose atropine. And then we use myopic soft contact lenses for nine months because I do routine checkup for them. So um, when she come back for the yearly routine checkup, I, and I would do the psychopedia examination, 1% psychopantolate, and actually basically change a little bit, not a lot. Prescription, whoa, you see, prescription change in the seal. Okay, 1.25, whoa, from 0.5 change to 1.25. The parents was really, really nervous. So what actually happened? What actually happened? You guess what actually happened, okay? Um, not because of the pandemic, not because of the electronic devices. It's because the cornea astigmatism. And when I do psychoplegic examination, the pupil much bigger. That's why she pick up all the uh, astigmatism, uh, which is something which I did many years ago. And I've, I, I sometimes just overlook uh, I, because the kids not considering doing also keratology or other things. I forgot to do uh, a good uh, routine check even on the corneal. So that's why the topographer will help us uh, to pick a lot of small information that we might have forgotten to 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 to, to, to write or to look into because the sick years of age. Okay. So a lot of things we need to do become a part of the routine for all my young kids. Um, doesn't matter where they whether they are doing whatever kind of Glasses. We just do a scan for most of the kids now. So at least we know some information about the cornea. And this is my last word to everyone. And why do we need a K5 scan in our practice? And because it's more than just a keratometer. So because it's not a keratometer. So remember, this is not a keratometer. Uh, we have to present to our patient, this is a topographer. We get lots of information about the anterior cornea. Okay, so we know not just the uh, I mean, the, the topography of the cornea. It's also give us a lot of information about the, the lead, the T's quality as well. So when we do contact lenses, the T quality is really important. A great machines for most of the contact lens fitting and the labs. So because it's built in with a lot of software and the simulated first in pattern, and that's why it can help us to do a lot of fitting, make our fitting much more easier. And one more thing I said, uh, the laboratory, because uh, some people might say about, oh, this topography is the best. This is the gold standard, this sort of thing. Okay? There are a lot of topography available in the market, but you have to think about what you look for, what do you need, and also what lab you're working together with. So which machines will work well with your lab? Okay, So there's a lot of things that we can't say, this is the gold standard, this is the best. Okay, That's a lot of things you have to think about. What's the best for your practice? What the best need for your uh, your clinic and your, your practice. This is very important. And K5 give you a lot of values in, in what we just hear today. And also I said, this is a topographer and inside the camera, and you can do the video and got the, the blue filters in there as well. So we can do a lot of things in one machine. And one more thing is uh, we can shorten the chair time and trial lens selection time. This is really important because um, we have to show them what we call the professionalism. So when we're having the machines, if a proper machines, we can show them how we practice professionally and, and we can spend more time in discussing and talking to the patients for what the patient needs. This is something really important. And this is a final last word uh, to all of us over in Philippines or other places. So continuous effort, not strength or intelligence, is the key to unlock our potential. So we have to see how we can lock, up, lock unlock our potential by using a, this machine, the K5, in our contact lens fitting.
So something we have to consider and think about how we can unlock the potential. So the few people I love to thank, uh, the TMC ITV, or of course APAC, and my friends, uh, uh, Richard, Will, Joe, and also my angel friends. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me in my email or talk to me anytime. Okay, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentations, Dr. Mihia, Dr. Muntz, Dr. Wu. Uh, I'd like to say that here at TMC, we were the first to acquire our Keratograph 5M, but we are by no means the only one. There are several centers that have the machine now. And thanks to your lectures, uh, I'm sure that each of those centers can now maximize the potential of their units uh, in their practice. So we've come to the Q&A section of, uh, for your talks. And I'd like to start. You no, know, I'd like to start a question for Dr. Wu. Okay, um, has the Keratograph 5M actually improved the flow for your for your contact lens fitting patients? And also, do you have any tips that you can share from your practice on how to have your pediatric patients cooperate when we have the tests taken uh, when they have the Keratograph 5M? Now, firstly, definitely, uh, you have to definitely you will improve the flow because you have the kids, um, even the adult, uh, <coughs> you have the K5 on, you're not just looking only the, uh, the, the quality information. You also look at the lead information and the teeth quality. That's very really important, especially if a young kid, uh, teenage, the teeth quality, lead hygiene is very really important. So we have to make sure uh, the parents understand what the lead hygiene okay that's why the machine is really handy helpful for us and the flow definitely more smoother because one machine can help me to do basically most of the thing so uh, it makes things much easier for for these and for pediatric definitely no problem for that <laughs> i was is really kids the kids love it and also in terms of the um, practice way the parents will be impressed about how the machine can actually help us to do all the uh, all the flow all the uh, management much more quicker and easier so the Parents will help you really happy about how the system work together with the machine. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll take now some questions from the audience. Okay, so our first question is, after diagnosing a patient with dry eye using the keratograph, do you recommend to repeat the keratograph breeding after dry eye treatment? What time interval after treatment would you recommend to repeat the keratograph reading. I'll direct this question first to Dr. Mihia. After that, perhaps Dr. Muntz, you can also step in after after that. All right. So after you have done your, for example, your baseline or your screening um, keratograph test, it is recommended that uh, you actually do a repeat keratograph after treatment so that you could actually see if there is improvement um, in the treatment intervention that you actually initiated. So it probably depends as to the time frame as to when you're going to do the, the, the repeat test, probably depends on the severity of the dry eyes that the patient has. If you are just considering or your working impression is just a mild evaporative type of dry eyes, then probably when you, once you start your, your lubricants or your, or your artificial tears, um, then in about two to four weeks time, you could actually have, have a repeat uh, keratograph test, okay? However, for the moderate or severe cases, then um, it may take a longer time for, for, for the keratograph to have any um, change. So if, for example, you're, you expect or you're expecting the ch your treatment, for example, you started treatment, and you're expecting the medication to start working in about four to six weeks time, like when you start your secretagogues, then maybe you could take, you could have your repeat test in about four to six weeks time. 
How about Alex? How about Dr. What's your... How, yeah, Dr. Munz. Sure. Uh, I absolutely agree with Dr. Mejia. The key point being that it very much depends on the type and the severity of the disease you're, you're, you're tackling with. Uh, definitely a repeat assessment with the car keratograph is warranted after treatment. That is the only way you can actually check treatment success. And the keratograph actually offers you very neat features to compare the different evaluations. Um, to put a exact time frame on these repeat measures is really hard because their evolution really depends not only do, you know in severity but also in one of the very recent studies we've done we've seen very different trajectories of the evolution of the evolution of symptoms which resolve much much earlier so for a mild version of dry eye disease with artificial tear solution we see a very fairly rapid um, improvement of symptoms after about a month. But some of the signs, uh, Nibot, for instance, uh, it takes about two to three months to resolve. And some of the other more, more advanced signs, if you will, such as corneal staining, conjunctival staining, will take even longer. So it really depends on what clinical signs you're looking looking at. Important, I think, is, is a good relationship, a good feedback with the patient, uh, free, you know, frequent enough follow-up and depending on the case to have him back in and, and, and assess True. 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 Okay. Our next question. Okay, um, the keratograph and... Uh, Myra, can you... Yeah, the keratograph and the Yenvis reports all look very impressive. Are there any weaknesses or downsides in using the machine? I'll have I'll have Dr. Muntz answer that question. <laughs> and I'll and I'd like to, to have an Oculus representative answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> They'll say no. <laughs> Um, it's, 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 it's tough to say. I mean, I think, I think, uh, um, uh, as, as Dr. Abu pointed out, there, there is no established gold standard. And I think you will find a weakness, uh, even if it's just based in preference, even if it's based in, 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 in the flow of assessments and the feel, ultimately that is important to the way you feel about a machine, the way you interact with a machine. I'm not aware of any measurements that are flawed per se, but there are certainly lots of clinical measures that still require validation and are not perfectly finalized yet and definitive with accurate sensitivity and specificity. So we're still working on a lot of these measures to be built in. The, the beauty about the keratograph is that allows for these subsequently to build to be built in and to be used. So it gives you a broad range of tests. Ultimately, it comes down to the user to select which tests are deemed adequate and and, well, and well, weed out the add, weaknesses. Just to weigh in here, I mean, for example, in the old days, okay, when they assessed dry eye, there was a consensus between practices where everybody did Shermers and everybody did breakup time. Okay. But now the keratograph is not the only non-invasive breakup or not the only non-invasive dry eye machine out there. And certainly different practices that use different machines, there will be no consensus between them right now. And so although the DOS 2 is promoting non-invasive um, measurements for, for dry eye, certainly if there's going to be more than one way to measure it, then different practices sort of can't corroborate that data anymore than they used to in the past. And so that's just part of the issues that are growing now uh, from all these technologies that are rising, I suppose. Okay, Evo, can we have uh, Myra? To, to add uh, Evo? Yes. Uh, okay, to add to what Alex actually mentioned regarding your question on the weakness of the machine, I don't, um, not the machine itself probably, but maybe it's the, it's on performing the examination. So for example, you, in, in cases wherein you have to flip the upper lid and you have to take a MABO scan. So it is during that process of taking the MABO scan that some difficulties are encountered as you flip the upper lid. 
or maybe because in Asia and Asian eyes we have smaller um, eyes so sometimes it's actually difficult to take even the non-invasive keratograph keratograph breakup time so it's like if the, the eye is too small so you can't see a whole picture of the cornea so I think it's more of um, sometimes it's anatomical um, that's causing the difficulty or in the weakness so there will be variability in the results of the test thank you okay. can we have another question then from the audience okay so are there instances where the meibomian gland grading for the upper and lower lids differ and what would be the grading in these instances uh let's have you answer that uh, dr mejia yeah. Yeah, probably. Okay, the first, sorry, can you repeat the first question there? Difference. No? There is a, yeah. the improvement. No, no, no. The, that is a, this is a different yeah. question already. I think the question is yeah. if there is. Are there a, is, yeah, are there instances wait, wait, where the mobile gland grading for the upper and lower lids differ? So, for example, grade one yeah. on top, grade two at the bottom. Okay, and uh, yeah. what would be the general grading, I guess, is what the question is trying to, to ask, if this were the right. case for, for an individual patient. Okay, so yes, we do encounter uh, different gradings for, for the upper and the lower lids in, a, in an individual. So in the classic um, dryer, or in the classic um, software, what we were doing this manually so we were we had to grade the upper lid and check the grading scale and then we had to look at the lower lid and get the grading scale but then the we, we, we what we did was we had to report the grade which is more severe however when i was tinkering around the genvis pro um since it was just installed recently i noticed that this time the mabography is already automated, so you get an automatic um, MABO scan score, and then they do an av they get an average of the readings of both the upper and lower lid. So the report now will show you an average of the upper and lower lids. Is that uh, is my interpretation of the new gen this pro correct, Alex? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say so. Yes. Yeah, we're yeah. So that's what, yeah, that's why I think the technology is helping us uh, life much more easier. Yeah, that's is something the weakness is we become more dependent on those uh, scientists uh, like Alex people who develop the, uh, this, the, the, the software, make things much more better for us to managing dry eyes. Yeah, I think managing dry is more than just getting the teas back in function. I think is we are also helping the patients, the life and the emotionals, a lot of things we can help them. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank and, you. And, and 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 I may just just add to that that you know the grading of mybography and many other of the clinical features is is again not not a perfect system because as you know the, it's it's grading it goes from zero to four or zero to three depending on which scale you use and these are very large categories so between zero and 30 30 percent drop up between 30 and 60 percent drop up so yeah. these are pretty wide ranges ultimately it comes down to an exact percentage that's not something you would, you know, you'd, you'd expect to do in clinic. But even that level of, of, of accuracy depends on your flipping skills and on the repeatability of averting the eyelid exactly in the same way every time. So I think a small degree of variability is to be expected, even if the technology is, is really advanced. Yeah, my, my personal tips is... Uh, for the assessment and flipping the lead, or <laughs> we try to get my dry patient come roughly the same time for each uh, visit because sometimes in the morning, afternoon, late afternoon, it might vary. So we try to come pretty much the same time and we flip right or left first, left or right first. <laughs> okay, this is something we tried. I mean, I, that's my sharing is try to have a consistent pattern for the patient. Otherwise, you, we may have a variations of the the pattern. Yeah. And make sure it's the last test too. Exactly. Yes, it's true. <laughs> and um, I think I read regards... somewhere uh, there's an article actually which um, showed that there's I think I don't know which company they they are trying to invent an, a flipper actually 
to make it easier for us to do that particular maneuver. We don't have it yet at the dry ice clinic, but I came sure. across uh, an article saying that one. So, Ivo, you can purchase one for us. <laughs> All right. So Maybe we have time for one more question. <laughs> Okay, uh, the next question. Myra? Uh, we have a last question. Are you able to assess or monitor improvement of meibomian glands after treatment? How often, at what interval do you assess this? Okay, uh, this involves someone who would treat uh, MGD. So, <laughs> I think... That's you, Myra. Okay. Okay. Let me, <laughs> let me try. <laughs> let me try. In clinic, probably once we see the dry eye patients and we will look at what the problem and we will provide some in-house treatment and also we have some uh, take-home treatment as well. So normally we see them four weeks, okay? Uh, Sometimes we will see them two weeks, depending on what treatment we do. Okay, even normal general uh, treatment planning for them is probably four weeks. And after we review it and we check like the non uh, the, the, the T break time, we check for the membomine glands. Probably sometimes four weeks might not see it that quickly. And then we might see them in the four to six weeks. Okay. If the treatment plans look looks well and the patient uh, responds well, we might free them maybe maybe next two months, three months. Okay. If they're not treat uh, if the if the treatment plan one might not working, we might do the treatment plan too. So when we see them in four weeks four weeks, yeah, a bit more frequent. So it depends on what the uh, the conditions of the dry eye and the membomian glands conditions as well. So there's a lot of things that's more individually tailored. I think we can have a general things for everyone. So individually we have to tailor. We have to know how to be flexible and how to observe what the patient needs and what we need. And also we have to listen to what the patient tell us how they feel as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I guess now uh, we will proceed to thank you everyone for answering all our questions. Okay, we will proceed to the next section of our presentation, uh, which is which will more point to the practicality of this machine, uh, which will be uh, discussing uh, or presenting some pertinent cases with regards to the keratograph. Okay, um, for, uh, the first presenter for this segment. Uh, just like our first speaker earlier, is also a graduate of the med. Uh, Dr. Trudy Agdepa completed her residency training as chief resident and also went became chief resident here at the Medical City. And uh, she underwent clinical and research fellowship in cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery at the VISUM, Instituto Ophthalmologico de Alicante in Spain, under Professor Jorge Alio. She is currently the head of the Laser and Refractive Center of the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute. Okay. Next, after her, uh, presenting will be Dr. Lawrence Pe. Lawrence is a graduate of residency over at the East Avenue Medical Center, uh, DOHI Center. He continued his training in cornea and external disease and refractive surgery at New York University and in Greece uh, under Dr. Kanilopoulos, John Kanilopoulos. Okay. He is currently the training officer in ophthalmology, the residency training officer at Carina Memorial Medical Center and is affiliated with East Avenue, St. Luke's, and the Medical City as well. Okay. And uh, to, to complete our case presenters, uh, the final case will be presented by Dr. Rod Soriano. Roger is a, as our guest optometrist from the Philippines. He's a clinical professor at Centro Escolar University, where he teaches optics and occupational industrial optometry, to name a few. He finished his uh, Doctor of Optometry at CEU and completed this master's in education at MCU, Manila Central University. So without further ado, let us hear what interesting cases they have to present.
Hi, good evening. I'd like to thank the ITZ team for inviting me again to present the case. Um, so for today, instead of one, I'm presenting two interesting cases side by side, um, just to highlight how useful the keratograph is in assessing dry eyes, especially when you're faced with patients with similar symptoms, but with varying degrees of severity. So to start, Um, this is a case of patient A, LB. Um, she's a 59-year-old businesswoman, while patient B, MB, is a 38-year-old housewife who came in for consult with complaints of foreign body and singing sensations on both eyes. Now, patient A happens to be the mother of patient B. Both patients report recurrent bouts of foreign body and singing sensation, particularly with reading and mobile phone use. Patient B, the daughter, claims that her symptoms are more severe now during the lockdown than before because she was using the computer more often as she was engaged in online selling, working from home, and tutoring her kids during their online classes. Patient A, the mother, on the other hand, told us that while she shares the same symptoms as her daughter's, um, Hers were only mild since she uses the, um, her cell phone less frequently, only when she's um, texting and when she's, com um, she's computing bills. She also told us that she, it was her daughter who really wanted to seek consult and that she tagged along because she wanted to get out of the house. Now, both are non-hypertensive, non-diabetic, and they report no other systemic illnesses. Both Patients were using the same lubricant eye drop for several years and have sometimes even shared the Now, patient A applies the drop only when she feels that her eyes are dry or when she remembers to apply them. But patient B has instilled the drop every one to two hours religiously during the past few months. So patient A has not had any ocular surgery in the past and has been using reading glasses. Patient B uses glasses for myopia only when she's driving. Now, symptom assessment using the OSDI questionnaire revealed that revealed scores of 19 for patient A, which is just mild, and um, 77, which is severe for patient B. Visual acuity of patient A is 20-25 for both eyes. Um, she's breast myopic um, using ads of 250. Patient B is myopic with a refraction of minus 125 on the right and minus 200 on the left. On slit lamp examination, it showed that patient A has an immature cataract on both eyes, a normal tear osmolarity result, and a slightly reduced Schirmer's test. Patient B's slit lamp findings are normal, as well as her osmolarity and Schirmer's test. Now, this is the Yenvis Pro. I got that right, Alex. Yenvis Pro dry eye report sum a summary. Note that for both patients, they look very similar, almost like a mirror image of the other. Now, um, for the tear meniscus height is slightly reduced for both patients. Nick butt is very short on the left eye in patient A, and is normal in patient B. Now, here lies one of the differences between our two patients. On interferometry, which is one of the special features of the keratograph, patient A exhibited a severe, very pale whitish hue, which signifies a deficient lipid layer. That means that this patient's outermost lipid layer is not thick enough to prevent evaporation of your aqueous components of the tear film. Now, in contrast, Patient B displayed a lipid layer at equilibrium with that yellowish, grayish hue that spreads across the ocular surface after each blink. Now, on the left eye, the difference between the two is more pronounced with that, if you can see here, the reddish to bluish hue, which signifies high lipid abundance in patient B, compared to that very pale, whitish surface of patient A. 
Now, on closer view of the meibomian gland orifices of patient A, you can see blocked, plugged, and capped meibomian glands with very few gland openings on both eyes. Although the lashes are clean with no colorette, the lid margins are moderately inflamed and reddened with some inspissated oils and pouting glands that are capped altogether. Now, conversely, patient B had only a few clotted glands with minimal visible vessels on the margin. On mabography, patient A had a moderate to severe MGD as, uh, as there were at least 67% of the glands that were either tortuous and plugged atrophied. Patient B had less of meibomian gland dropout. Uh, although it could not um, be assessed fully because of an incomplete blink, the tear breakup pattern observed in patient A is a random break on the right, which is consistent with an increased evaporative state, and a spot break on the left, which is due to a decreased wettability of the superficial layer. Patient B's breakup pattern is a combination of a line break with rapid expansion and a spot break on the right. There's also a spot break on the left eye. Now, both are signs of the decreased wettability. Now, for both patients, there were no areas of punctate staining, which means that this is mainly a problem of increased evaporation and of decreased wettability. Now, both our patient's eyes were neither red nor severely inflamed. Now, our impression for patient A is an evaporative type of dry eye with, some compo with, a, with a component of decreased wettability. She also has moderate to severe MGD. Patient B showed more of a decreased wettability type of dry eye and mild meibomian gland dysfunction. Now, to treat patient A, we asked her to start warm compresses, lid hygiene, and do lid massages. We also shifted her lubricant drops, which would address more the increased evaporation and decreased wettability. We also added an antibiotic steroid ointment lid scrub to decrease the inflammation. We also recommended that she undergo Blefex as, as well as ITL with low-level light therapy and with meibomian gland expression. Now, for patient B, we asked her to modify the environment where she works, just lower the computer screen and move it farther away from her eye, avoid any draft from ventilation from the air con. Um, we told her to blink often as um, computer screens are known to less than one blink rate. Um, we told her to observe the 20-20-20 rule, as was discussed in the last episode. We also told her to start warm compress and lid hygiene to prevent any worsening of her MGD. And we also gave drops to address the decreased wettability. So as you can see in the two cases, they have similar symptoms. One was even more severe than the other, but it turns out that her dry eye was actually milder than her mother's dry eye. Now, probably it was just exacerbated by the way she's been conducting her work or her exposure to digital screens. So by doing the keratograph, we were able to identify the main problem and differentiate the two cases. We were able to assess dry eye objectively and more efficiently so that we were, we were able to better customize our treatment regimen. Now, briefly, I will discuss these two procedures I've mentioned as part of our plan for patient A. So Blefex is a painless in-office procedure wherein a medical-grade micro-sponge spins and rotates along the edge of your eyelids and lashes, removing your scurfs and debris, and exfoliates your eyelids. It eases the signs and symptoms of evaporative dry eye associated with sepharitis. Um, this procedure lasts for around six to eight minutes and is generally well tolerated. Now, as it cleans the lid margins, it also opens up your meibomian gland orifices, um, allowing more of the oil to return to the ocular surface. Now, IPL 
On the other hand, is also an in-office procedure for NGD. Um, dermatologists have been using IPL for years, and for opto it's an off-label use for ophthalmology. Um, what it does is it delivers intense pulses of non-coherent bright light. Um, it softens your meibom and it aids in the expression of your meibomian gland. Now we have these. Um, three machines actually, the Plefex, IPL, and also the Keratograph 5M in our um, institute, in our dry eye clinic. So it makes us a, a one-stop shop for a more comprehensive assessment and, dry, um, and treatment of dry eye. Um, before I end, I'd like to thank Dr. Tina Tan for helping me with my presentation. So thank you very much. Hi, good evening. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you for the organizers for uh, uh, inviting us over. I'm actually filling in for uh, Dr. Reynaldo Santos, who is our um, immediate past chairman at the Department of Health Eye Center. Uh, currently, Dr. Uh, Santos is uh, uh, busy with several commitments, and he asked me to uh, present on behalf of uh, East Abbey. So we've had the um, uh, Keratograph 5M since I think uh, 2017, and it, we've been using it uh, for evaluation of our dry eye patients, as well as uh, for the evaluation of uh, uh, corneal problems, corneal scars, post PK patients, and uh, the like. But for now, I'll be uh, presenting one of our cases uh, of a dry eye uh, patient. We saw this patient uh, uh, last week. And um, she came in uh, because uh, complaining of dryness and irritation in both eyes. 31 year old female office clerk. So her symptoms started two years uh, prior to consult when she experienced frequent dryness in both eyes. Uh, but actually the uh, symptoms escalated two months prior to consult and increased in severity. Now, um, interfering with her normal functioning. She complains of redness, gritty feeling in both eyes and tearing, especially noted after long hours of uh, computer use. She sought consult with an ophthalmologist in her area, and of course she was diagnosed with dry eye syndrome, and she was given hypomelos eye drops, which gave her some relief, but then uh, she was not content and she sought consult our, at our institution. For the medical history, she was diagnosed to have psoriasis in uh, 2015 after workup of recurring lesions on the extensor surfaces of her arms, lower extremities, and elbows. Uh, but since then, it has been uh, controlled by the use of topical medications, uh, namely triamcinolone. For the ocular history, uh, she used to use cosmetic lenses but has become intolerant to them uh, of late. Uh, she claims that she last used contact lenses about a year ago. For the review of medications, as I've said, uh, she uses hypromelose eye drops uh, on a as needed basis, which comes to about five to six times in a day for relief of symptoms. Um, there are currently no systemic medications. Occupational and environmental risk factors. Uh, she works in front of the computer for long hours as, uh, as a clerk, and she works in an air-conditioned air office, which is uh, a dry environment. Sorry, my, my screen would not advance.
Okay, just I'll just reshare my screen again. Okay, so okay, so there you go. For a symptom assessment, we use the OSDI, which is a standard questionnaire. Um, among the um, symptoms that are significant is the creepy feeling in your eyes or in Filipino mabuhangin, which she experiences most of the time. And um, she also complains of visual symptoms uh, while using the computer. So all of this total uh, comes to an OSDI coefficient of 50, which uh, is equivalent to moderate symptoms. So for the uh, examination, her visual acuity is uh, a labor 2020 in both eyes with no further improvement with refraction. A gross examination shows very slight hyperemia in both eyes. Slit lamp shows uh, deep anterior chambers, round pupils in both eyes, clear lenses, no cells, no flare, uh, no signs of previous attacks of uveitis, which can be present in patients with psoriasis. What was significant though was this uh, punctate epithelial erosions or PEEs uh, in the area of the palpebral fissures in both eyes, more on the right compared to the left. And with TFOT or tear film um, oriented diagnosis, we saw a repetitive line breaks in these areas as well. Line breaks. So for the dry eye test with the keratograph, we measured the tear meniscus, which was quite low in the right, 0.14 and uh, 0.26 on the left, which is still normal, but very low. Uh, the NICBAT or the non-invasive uh, keratograph breakup time was five, about five in the right, which averages to 13, which is still okay. And uh, about six in the left, which averages to about 14. Uh, the Schirmer's test done, or the basal tear secretion, we measured uh, four millimeters in both eyes, which is quite low. So moving on, we see how we measure the tear meniscus height. You can either use the infrared light or the white light. Uh, in this case, we use the infrared light. And so we measure the tear meniscus just right under the pupil. We measured 14 here in the in the left, in the right, I'm sorry, and 26 in the left. So for those uh, uh, listeners, the normal cutoff value is around 0.2, but you'd uh, normally see above uh, around 0.4 millimeter tear meniscus. This is the tear breakup pattern with the nick butt, and this is the co uh, color map to see the red and orange areas correspond to the areas which have earlier breakup. And this also corresponds to the areas of the PEEs, PEEs and the line break in the uh, slit lamp examination. Similar with the left eye. So this is the redness grading with the keratograph. So you can see these are the gross pictures about right and left. And the keratograph grades the bulbar areas for uh, redness for dry eye anyway. So the keratograph graded this patient as uh, 0.7 in both eyes, which is uh, from a scale of zero to four. So the next uh, useful test is the MEBO scan or the mebography. So these are the encircled are the actual photos of the patient's eyelid diverted and below them is the standard scale. So you just move this left and right to match which one, um, which um, a picture matches your uh, patient's um, embography. So in this patient actually has a good uh, Lubomian gland length. It reaches up to the, the tarsal end on the other side. And you see that they are very closely packed, meaning that there's minimum fallout or dropout. So this is graded as one in the in the right eye and uh, very similar also in the left, a little worse, but very similar. So this is the lip, lipid layer analysis in uh, 
in the in our patient uh, as discussed maybe a while ago you see the very uh, good lipid layer in this patient you'll see the uh, bronze and yellow uh, uh, reflections in both the right and left eye so the lipid layer in this particular patient was was good so moving on another useful scan is the tear film dynamics this actually allows you to observe the movement of uh, particles suspended in the tear film. And this movement is also affected by the tear volume and tear viscosity. So meaning that if you have adequate uh, uh, tear volume, uh, you see this uh, particles move up faster. It's quite slow, especially in the right. So observe here. And finally, we have the Yen this uh, report. So this is for the right eye. This is actually a uh, composite of the tests done. We usually use this uh, standard uh, graphic with five points, including the nick bot, the redness, lipography, tear meniscus height, and the uh, questionnaire score. As you can see, all of them are in the green except for the tear meniscus height and the dry eye questionnaire and very similar with the left eye as well. Okay, so to, to sum it up, we gave the impression of moderate dry eye in both eyes. And for the default, this was a line break pattern, which is also suggestive of a low tier volume. And uh, I would go further and say that this is predominantly an aqueous deficiency dry eye type, uh, dry eye syndrome. So for the management, uh, we gave the patient uh, lipofacil sodium, 3% at six times a day. Uh, this is to increase her tear uh, volume. And we also added cyclosporine at one milligram uh, per ml once daily to address the inflammatory nature of her condition. And although uh, psoriasis and uh, dry eye is not often discussed, not, not like uh, uh, job rents or SLE uh, in relation to dry eye. Uh, psoriasis has been cited uh, numerous times in literature as a risk factor for the development of uh, dry eye disease. And although we haven't uh, repeated the test on the patient, we did call her up after uh, seven days of treatment and she did uh, uh, claim that she has much improved. And uh, I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I would like to, of course, thank ITV team for having me. Special thanks also to Dr. Asina, Dr. Mike, and Dr. Chris, and of course, um, Dr. Christina Tan for all the help. Um, uh, my slide, please. Thank you. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Central Scholar School of Optometry. Next slide, please. My case, um, can you go back, please? Okay, my case is LA, a 29-year-old instructor with chief complaint of blurring of vision far over OD and of uh, an ease use of spectacle. Next slide, please. For medical history, um, the patient is generally healthy. Next slide, please. For ocular history, he was uh, diagnosed and was given a spectacle. Um, a CMA over OD and Plano over OS with anisometropia. Next slide, please.
for the subjective findings, visual acuity on aided was 2400 with uh, pinhole improved 2060. Um, refraction minus four combined minus one cylinder and left eye 2020. Next slide, please. For the objective examination, um, internal exam, no significant findings was found in. Also with uh, external exam, also no significant findings. Um, our key reading show us a corneal astigmatism of uh, minus 125. And our objective uh, findings in the refraction is minus 375 combined one, uh, minus 150 axis 120. Over the left, it's plain. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now for uh, the assessment, we made use of the Oculus K5. As you can see here, um, you can see the topography findings. If you uh, please, next slide. OK, over here, you'll see the topography finding. If you go below, you'll see there the radius of curvature. As you can see, the blue refers to the flattest, and the red represents the steepest. If you can see the keratometric um, box at the bottom, so you'll have there your also your eccentricity value for your cornea. Also, you'll have there the amount of stigmatism present. Also uh, helpful is your um, ocular diameter or the corneas the diameter, as you can see there. Um, uh, it's the, the line right there that gives us around 11.8. Next slide, please. OK, here, as you can see, um, you can look at the, the map. And you can see that there's an apical astigmatism contained apically. So you're looking at probably just giving a uh, sphere. And uh, if you check the bottom part, you can see the amount of astigmatism as uh, the red represents the steepest and the blue as the flattest. Next slide, please. So now what we do is we made use of the simulator. So um, this is very useful instead of um, using trial lenses over and over wherein the patient might not be so comfortable and might uh, find it uh, uh, so uncomfortable. Um, this is very useful. Oculus K5 is very useful in the assessment um, of uh, the fluorescent pattern. So as you can see here, we simulated the fluorescent pattern. So here, if you look at the graph at the bottom, so that's the relationship of the, the contact lens in relation with the cornea. So you can see the distance and you can see the over uh, the under flush that you might want to adjust. So by using this one, you can now uh, somehow have an idea of what will be the fit once you have your actual trial lens. Next slide, please. Okay, as I was saying, um, all you got to do is um, put all the basic references, such as the radius of curvature of the flattest K. Um, in this case, as you can see, um, you might be thinking of including um, the toricity. So you might want to uh, add the steepest value as you uh, simulate so that you can have a good under flush. And uh, again, as I've said, in getting um, the lens diameter, you base it on the corneas diameter. So what you do is you subtract around uh, 1.5 millimeters, or maybe you can have a 2 to 2.5 uh, millimeters 
reduction from your um, corneal diameter. So as you can see here, this is our uh, simulated uh, fluorescent pattern. So next slide, please. So here you can see um, all the, probably all the important uh, details that you might want to use. So you can have there your mathematical computation. So you're using the RGP lens and you might also want to put the radius of curvature. In case of our, uh, um, in this situation, um, we made use also of uh, the toric. Um, all you got to do is just click the toric and uh, you would have a better assessment. So if you um, press for the next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, as you can see here, um, we made use of the actual uh, trial lens that would be on your right. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, here, as you can see, is um, the behavior of your um, supposed uh, RGP if you are to use these parameters. So you are simulating. So you can see there that this is this is good. All you got to do is probably adjust more on the touristy. Um, having probably when you design, you might want to add uh, a tri-curve, a multi-curve. For that matter, so that you can have the best uh, assessment. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, you can see here when we're actually assessing the the tear film before using the um, RGP lens. So um, this is a, a good representation to know whether um, the tear film is good or not. So next slide, please. So here um, you can see uh, the on uh, over the the right you can see the actual RGB lens. So if you uh, click one more time, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, as I was mentioning, uh, you can see at the bottom is the relationship of your um, RGP to try uh, the relationship, uh, the RGP and the cornea and its behavior. So you have a little understanding of what it's gonna, it's gonna be when you place the actual contact lens in. Right now, if you press one more, please, uh, next slide. I believe that's a video, you can uh, press it. Next slide, please. Next slide. I believe that's the video. Okay, if you may, please click that video. The next slide, the one that, the video, please. There you go. As you can see in the video, okay, let's try to watch this. There you go. So this is now the uh, actual trial lens that we placed. Uh, okay, there you go. So it, as you can see, it's centered, and you can see uh, the fluorescent pattern. So you can see the under flush is relatively good. All you got to do is adjust a little, probably um, uh, include the eccentricity uh, for the, for the multi-curve. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There you go. After doing all the evaluation, uh, we did a lot of adjustments, uh, changing the overall diameter in the base curve. Um, and we did the fitting assessment wherein the patient is comfortable. Um, we check all the lag, the movement on blink, and of course the fluorescent pattern. After that, we dispense. 
So for management, um, the patient was prescribed an RGP lens over the OD, and he was also educated about the visual hygiene 2020 and also uh, scheduled for follow-up checkup. That ends my slide. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much for those wonderful presentations. Uh, we will now proceed to our uh, questions uh, for the case presenters. But before we take questions from the audience, I'd like to ask uh, our earlier presenters, uh, Dr. Wu, Dr. Mejia, uh, if you have any comments on any of the cases presented just now. Okay, maybe I'd, I'd start first. For the case presented by um, Dr. Agdepa, so it's, it's there, those are two cases, and it seems like there is a, initially you would think there is a disparity between the symptoms of the patient, the subjective symptoms, yes. and uh -huh. comparing it to the diagnostic or assessment results. Now, I'm thinking uh -huh. of my line of thinking there is like this. For the patient, for patient A, who is the mother, okay, mm -hmm. so she had mild OS, a uh, uh, low OSDI score, but the other tests revealed a moderate um, kind of dry eyes, right? Evaporative, yeah, decreased uh, ability. So my mm -hmm. my line of thinking there, the the, the 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 probable explanation there is. The chronicity of the dry eyes um, has been clinically or has been clinically suggested that it causes a desensitization. So probably the, the dry eyes is actually chronic, chronic in nature already. So the sensitivity, the subjective symptoms were dampened. This and but this but the clinical findings showed that the um, the, the degree of the dry eyes was actually moderate. Now, in mm -hmm. comparison right. to the to patient B, okay, who is a young, who is a younger individual, all right. My line of thinking there, the disparity there might be explained by the younger patient uh, might be having some form of neural epithelial um, sensitization or sensitivity. So the mm -hmm. symptoms, the subjective symptoms. Are more severe. The OSDI score was around 78, if I remember. But this yes. and despite that OSDI score, the clinical findings, the the assessments done using the were milder. Okay, so 
So in other words, even so that that would probably be the explanation for the disparity between the subjective symptoms and the clinical findings. But despite that, you have your symptoms and you have your um, results from all the tests done that will already guide you as to what treatment or to direct you on what treatment you should start um, for their, those particular patients. That's my comment. Well, that's um, the beauty of I these. I agree, Marga. Yeah, that's the beauty of these sensitive yes, tests because uh, symptoms are all going to present the same, and obviously, they mm -hmm. if they live together or they know each other, then they're going to probably assume they have the same thing. But in fact, when you subject them to these kinds of tests, then they might have very different things, and and therein lies uh, the value of these kinds of tests for these kinds of patients. Uh, Doctor Wu, do you have any comment regarding any of? the cases presented just now? I think a lot of the dry patients, we really good in time. Make what's, uh, <laughs> what's the real uh, Dr. Wu, um, we're not uh, hearing you well. Sorry. Yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah, I think you need to adjust your mic, Dr. Wu. I think. There's an echo. Um, not really, yeah. not really. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it sounds like you have an effects. <laughs> okay, I got the phone. Yes, please, yes, please. If we can ask you to reconnect. That would be a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, we'll ask you to reconnect. In the meantime, uh, as you reconnect, Dr. Wu, we're going to take questions from the audience uh, for our case presenters in the meantime. So if there, if you can have questions from the audience, uh, Myra will read and direct these questions accordingly. So we have a first question. Is it necessary to use these in office devices? For all patients with MGD and dry eye. Yes. Um, yes, true. Yes, Myra. Um, it's recommended for patients with MGD and dry eye associated nephritis. In fact, there was a clinical survey done last year by the ESCRS, and which was presented in the last convention, where they asked. Um, a panel of experts for the role of these in-office procedures in the treatment of um, MGD. And um, most of the respondents uh, said that, um, well, majority of them said that um, they, they use these in-office procedures for significant and severe dry eye. And some of them have already tried it as a free um, therapy for uh, MGD, but if you need it for all patients, let's say that it's not 100% absolutely necessary to do it for all, and patients still need to do their lid scrubs, they still need to do their warm compresses, but sometimes you see these patients with very stubborn scurfs, and color it and those who return after weeks of doing lid scrubs and it's still the same because they they're not doing it properly so somehow by doing these procedures it helps in the process and it eases the symptoms um it gives you more value um to your treatment and to a certain extent it makes your right. approach more holistic I mean, just like Hello. doing the karate, why, why rely on staining and Shermer's test when you can have an ODRS, right? So it's a step forward in the dry eye diagnosis and management. All right, if we have I Dr. May add Ruba, to what I believe. He said. Oh. oh, hi. Yeah, if I may add to what Trudy said, because um, okay. in relation to those office procedures, um, when you diagnose meibomian MGD, it's not just looking at the anatomy of the meibomian glands or the dropout. So MGD is diagnosed with um, gland 
uh, sorry, obstruction combined with a change in the quantity and quality of the meibomian gland secretion. So if you do those tests that um, Dr. Agdepa actually mentioned, which is the BLEFX and the IPL, this will also help address the, the, the secretion problem, like the quality and quantity might, uh, the quality and the quantity might improve by doing those procedures. So it forms part of a complete treatment for MGD. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marga. Uh, Dr. Wu, can we see if we can hear you properly now? Yep, 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 yep. All right. Yeah, uh, can you yeah. comment on any of the cases presented earlier? I think the, the we, we need to have a systematic way, especially in dry eye management. We have to have a systematic way to, to, to analyze and to the treatment and for the follow-up. That's very important. That's why is I think a lot of questions asked about whether we necessarily to have this machine or that system. And I, I think it's, it's a must because like, for example, like we, we talk about used to be, we put the furosine, uh, phenol red, all the things uh, to look at the tea breakup time. But now we know this is not the best way. We have to use the non-intrusive way to look at the tea breakup time. I think that's the things we need to, um, we try to have a, uh, uh, what, what I call like a more standardized way to, to do things. Maybe there may be some standardized way in uh, Southeast Asia, Asia, because we have a bit different, um, uh, like I'm not demographic, I talk about it's more like a season, like for example, Philippines, the environment will be different to, um, to in Australia. All right, that's so something, I mean, for example, Philippines might get a lot of big data down the track in the future in the next like, five years, mm -hmm. you may have a way as data, mm -hmm. this is how the Philippine data and the other country of the data. So we can know how to have a more, mm -hmm. more like a more reference better we can refer to. Like people in my practice in July, okay? We are winter in July, it's just so cold. <laughs> when it comes to my room, it's with the heat has on, though the humidity really dry, <laughs> okay? So this is different. The dry and analysis will be totally different. There's a lot of things that we try to see whether we can have a, like a different country, have a different, uh, like some 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 delta inside. I think that will be great, especially in Philippines, a lot of good doctors and ODs around. So we, I mean, I, I'm proud of you guys, so you guys can have a really good uh, data, get it together and pop the something, just mainly to make the uh, the people in Philippines uh, benefit from your, your, your specialty, your technique, your skills and your expertise, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Wu. Okay, let's have another question from the audience. Okay, uh, can young patients have dry eye disease? Uh, how young can they manifest? Uh, will the normal values be the same for children? And I think this is appropriate uh, for you, Dr. Wu, since you have an interest in pediatric uh, optometry <laughs> as well. I, I think Dr. Marga will probably this who notice we have more young people getting more MGD problem. So um, the more you see kids on contact lenses, the more you will notice they have more problem with, uh, with, with dry and MGD. And also nowadays, a lot of young people put on makeup, okay? And uh, also the lifestyle is very different. I think lifestyle is something that's really different. It's, it's how many hours you sleep. It's the quality of sleep they, they do. Okay, and and the, what time they actually sleep? I mean, the body metabolism system different, so the T's quality also will be different. So the youngest I have seen in my practice, probably my my, my most of my my young kids, I really look into the the lead and the cornea is probably my my um, um, either soft con soft contents or ortho okay patients. Some of them even six seven years of age are really have some NGD problem because the membomine gum block and the tea, the lead hygiene is, is really, really, really bad. So yeah, we basically, basically see like, uh, you can see the score there every day we see kids with the lead problem. I mean, the, the membomine gum problem, dry problem. Yeah. How about you, Dr. Maga? 
Well, I think with the question as to whether kids may manifest dry eyes, maybe the answer there is yes, especially at present times that all of us, majority here in the Philippines, um, schooling is actually online. Okay, So they are not physically in the schools. So most of them are, uh, we actually discussed this in the previous episode. They're having those digital eye strains and dry eyes. So definitely with as far as uh, presence of dry eyes, yes, it may manifest in children. As to how to, the second question is like how to, but testing for dry eyes for children might be a little difficult depending on, on the age group. Um, performing the keratograph on the ver on the younger ones might be difficult, especially the nick bot, okay? Because you have to stare or you have to look at the the the, the machine for about like 15 seconds to be able to get, for example, the nick bot. Or so in that particular aspect, it might be difficult to do the K5. I do. I haven't seen any paper doing it on children. I'm not sure. As to the um, what's the last question? Sorry, hello. This is the last. Yep. Now the, can we post again the previous question? The most recent one. No, no, the most recent one. Oh, this is the last question, isn't it? There were, yeah, I, there were three. Yeah. yeah. No, the question for ah, the pediatric was, yeah, the are the values the same? Values. Are the values the yes. same? Okay, I remember. Mm. Currently, there's no um, differentiation in terms of out of values for the pediatrics or the adult. So for now, we are using this. If you are to do those tests, maybe for now, we will be using exactly the same um, values. Maybe future studies will, will give us if there's really a variation, then we would use a pediatric value. But currently, there's none. Great. Uh, can we have the next question from the audience? Oh, uh, Dr. Pe has a question. Yes, I just have a question for uh, Dr. Wu. What's the difference between the K5 and the 5M? Is there, is there a difference in the uh, capabilities of, of these uh, devices? I, I haven't I, seen I personally, uh, okay. I personally find they're no different, just the different name they call it. And the oh. 5M now, they got the blue light, which is the which is mm -hmm. the latest one, the blue light. And otherwise, all the okay. functions are exactly the same. Or the function exactly same. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Is there are there other questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, so in your practice, do you see the keratograph to screen patients for dry eye disease prior to cataract and or refractive surgery? Okay. Who would like to take this uh, question? If it's cataract and refractive surgery, that's Dr. Mejia. Dr. Agdepa, who's the head I, of our I, I think, center. I, I think this was part of uh, the, was, I mentioned this in one of the slides that definitely it would be prudent actually to be a good add-on to your pre-surgery plan to actually have the keratograph test done prior to, especially if you're doing if you're planning to do a premium IOL implantation, as I've mentioned, and definitely um, we all know that refractive surgery can um, make uh, uh, can make dry eyes can worsen, no? Can make the dry eyes worse, or it can actually lead to dry eyes as a, as a one of the um, com uh, common conditions we encounter post LASIK. So yes, we would it would be good to actually do a keratograph on those patients. Okay, so question, a follow-up yes. to that. Should it be done before or after biometry? Before biometry. Should it be done too. before biometry? Before biometry. Some, sometimes yeah. we even because. suggest after a keratograph, and we know that the patient is for premium IOL implantation, we even put it in the recommendation that you might want to treat the dry eyes first and then have a repeat um, keratograph and then another biometry before you actually do the surgery. Yeah, because I co-manage with, uh, well, we not co-management, some of the ophthalmologists uh, I work together with, and they really, really concerned about special toric lenses, like Dr. Maga said, about the premium lenses. Toric IOL lenses, if the t surf is not good, they might have a wrong axis or wrong astigmatism among, and also biometry also wrong as well. So I think this is something um, would be more like a co-management or some patient 
before they go for the cataract surgery, we need to do to assess the the corneal the corneal integrity. So what we all look into that the OSD. OSD is something where we can help to do a lot of things for our patients. If I may add to that, um, we already have um, package in the laser refractive center. In the dry eye clinic, we do a premium IOL package. So that means that we, should, um, we do a keratograph, we do a uh, corneal topography prior to, um, if you're planning to implant a premium IOL um, for your patient. Also for refractive surgery, if we do see that patients already have um, dry eye upon examination, we um, ask them to undergo the keratograph as well. All right, do we have any more questions? Ooh, I don't want to know the answer to this question. And the question is, can COVID mask uh, increase dry eye symptoms? That's an interesting question to which uh, we really let, don't want to know the answer. Who would like to take this? Dr. Wu, yes. Let, <laughs> give one second, give one second. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely did one with. <laughs> definitely, we have dry eye because all the steam go up this way. Yep. Uh, we have more people got dry eyes. <laughs> Roger, you put on your mask. <laughs> yeah, wait up. <laughs> wait. So we definitely. know that we know that COVID. Can, can manifest as conjunctivitis. And yes. symptoms of conjunctivitis can be misinterpreted or can mimic that of dry eye as well. And so because the symptoms of dry eye are nonspecific, it's really hard to, to tell. But nevertheless, uh, I would not sort of... I mean, if, if, if somebody I would suspect of having COVID and those who come to the hospital, we screen them, okay? Uh, I would not try. I would be in the back burner for that, obviously. Okay, I would not expose them to to other staff. I would not expose them to the machine. Uh, they follow a different pathway, uh, and just not, you know, put them in the in the treatment for for dry eye and all that stuff. At least that's mine. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay, Doctor Wu, this is for you. Okay, uh, how important is the eccentricity value of the lens for contact lens fitting using the keratograph? I noticed in the machine, when you give, mm -hmm. when they give you the different options for the brands, it comes with diameter, base curve, and eccentricity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, we don't know. We, we have very few selection or choices of, of hard lenses here in our country, and the eccentricity mm -hmm. value is not stated. And so, my and the question states, and this is not from me, but from somebody else, uh, how important is that eccentricity value uh, when you fit for RGP or for contact lenses? I think eccentricity we know is how the the, the, the speed of the curve changes from the apex towards the peripheral. So, if we just look at the three mil center of the cornea, so we don't know what the peripheral looks like. So we have to understand the Near more detail. Oh, that's right. Eccentricity is now an important value for us to how of the contact lens of the cornea. So we want a contact lens is just sitting on the top of the cornea, not contact contact. Right. If we contact 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 the cornea, we have a lot of contact problems. So that's why I also mentioned about the uh, the elevation. So probably in the future we can let's have a look of the ele I mean the elevations of the uh, contact lens fitting. So I think that's a that's a that's a that's a trend for the future is elevations fitting method instead of just the uh, uh, radius curvatures and eccentricity. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing we have to look at the elevations of the contact lenses and the cornea to achieve the best optimal fitting for the contact to, to the contact and cornea. I think eccentricity is really important, uh, especially when we're fitting off of keratology lenses, especially as mm -hmm. well. So, yeah. And also one but more that, thing before we head up. Yeah. Yes. But that value is proprietary to the brand, right? So obviously different brands will have different, different eccentricity values. Yeah. 
different brand have a different one, but most of the time now the lab is quite comfortable to disclose to us now. This disclose to us right. now. And right. and yeah, I think that's is important. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. If I may add, um, when it comes to eccentricity, I mentioned uh, earlier that here in the Philippines, I think that's uh, kind of hard because uh, it, it you know most of the manufacturer here does not uh, include or does not state the eccentricity value. Um, uh, for that matter, you know the eccentricity value actually also works for de designing your own lens. The reason why you might want to do that so that you'll have good fit. So whether you want to do a multi-curve, you know, or um, tri-curve. So um, that, that is very useful. So, but uh, again, as mentioned here in the Philippines, I think that's uh, one obstacle. Um, but uh, offshore, I think, uh, as uh, Dr. Wu mentioned, uh, in, in also in Malaysia, they are already do that. They, their laboratory are very ready now to, you know, uh, provide you with eccentricity value of their contact lenses. So hopefully we will follow suit. I think, yep, 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 yep. I think, you, yeah, you can, I mean, you guys can start setting a standard to tell mm -hmm. all the lab to disclose right. and to make the industry, I mean, the disclosure is, is actually make the industry grow and make the profession mm -hmm. even better. I think that is something yep. is benefit for everyone. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. Uh, can we go for the next question? Mm. This is specific for Dr. Soriano. So, uh, <laughs> okay. have you experienced using the K5 for contact lens fitting? How easy or difficult do you think our Philippine optometrists will adopt to this new technology? Oh. Uh, okay, it's, it's like this. When I first used it, I said, this is, okay, I'm, I'm not endorsing anything, nor I'm employed by them. But when I used it, and I would like to special uh, special thanks to Dr. Tina for assisting. Um, to be honest, it was a lot easier, you know. Um, it's really easy because all the data is there. All the things that you need from the HVID, which is your uh, corneal diameter. You also have there the base curve, the radius of curvature from the flat, the steep. Almost everything is there. So all you got to do is just input everything, and then you can also simulate. The problem is if you do your trial lens fitting, um, most of the time patients would always uh, uh, have a hard time or maybe to the point of not saying uncomfortable. It's no longer uncomfortable. They would even say, this is painful process. They don't want to go through it. But because of this um, Oculus K5, um, I think it's a lot easier to explain to patients also like this is what's going to happen before I place it there instead of just to keep on trying things. And, you know, um, it's a long process. But this one, actually, I think optometrists should be uh, open enough to to try this because this is for me. Again, I'm not endorsing anything. I'm not, I'm not part of that company. So um, but I'm I'm delighted to use it. I'm very delighted and I would endorse it. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and I guess that was the last question from our viewers. Yeah, that's it. Um, thank you to all our speakers. This has been such a great learning and hosting opportunity. I would like to thank TMC ITV for inviting me. Uh, for the next episode of TMC ITV, join us again for the 11th episode of TMC ITV on October 22 at 5 p.m., where we will be discussing innovations in surgical techniques in the field of glaucoma. Okay, our numbers of our number of subscribers continue to grow. Thank you for staying with us uh, from the beginning. And as always, don't forget to click on the thumbs up to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified whenever we release new videos from our YouTube channel. Thank you once again to Oculus for partnering with us in this episode. And thank you very much to our speakers, Dr. Marga Mejia, Dr. Alex Moons, Oliver, Dr. Oliver Wu, and of course our case presenters, Dr. Trudy Agdepa, Dr. Lawrence Pe, and Dr. Rojai Soriano for making this episode possible. We would like to express our gratitude to all our attendees for joining us today. Once again, I am Dr. Myra Ocubilio. And I am Dr. Ivo Dwalan. 
See you all in the next episode of TMC ITV, Ophthalmic Instruction Without Borders.